Good day. In my last video, I discussed um, it, um, the meeting, the virtual meeting, which took place between Russian President Putin, German Chancellor uh, Merkel, and French President Emmanuel Macron on Tuesday, 30th March 2021. I said that contrary to what the media in the West has been saying, it is unlikely that the primary focus of this meeting was um, European purchases of the Sputnik V vaccine. Rather, it was Russian-EU relations which were discussed, and it was clear from the Kremlin's readout of the conversation that a major topic was Ukraine. Now, I have done over the last few weeks on this channel various programs in which I have discussed the large Ukrainian build-up, military build-up, that has taken place along the ceasefire line as, Ukrainian, as Ukraine has moved uh, troops and heavy equipment close to the ceasefire line um, with the two rebel republics uh, or breakaway republics of the Donbass, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. Um, I discussed how, over the course of the meeting with Macron and Merkel, Putin brought up this issue and warned uh, Merkel and Macron that the, uh, that the fault for the um, disintegration of the ceasefire, which has taken place um, over the last few weeks, with uh, shelling across the ceasefire line and with soldiers, especially Ukrainian soldiers apparently being killed, less rests with the people whom he referred to as the Kiev authorities and how um, in the event of further conflict, um, Kiev or the Ukraine would face consequences. Um, there's after that meeting, there's been a flurry of moves from the Russians, which are clearly intended to reinforce these points. Firstly, we've had a press conference um, um, by Russian presidential spokesman Dmitry Peskov. Peskov is Putin's own spokesman, and he sets out the policy and political lines that uh, uh, Putin is, is following. And he made it very clear that, in fact, Putin did, in fact, give a warning to Merkel and Macron about the situation in Ukraine. I will now read the uh, his comments as they have been reported, Peskov's comments, as these have been reported by Russia's TASS news agency. I would like to reiterate that the goal was not to replace the Minsk platform, that is the uh, proposed uh, format, agreed, in Minsk in 2015, whereby Ukraine was supposed to negotiate directly with the leaders of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. Uh, the range of issues on the agenda was much wider than just Ukraine. However, they discussed Ukraine in detail. And then Peskov goes on to say that Putin did not draw any lines in connection to uh, uh, the situation in southeastern Ukraine because, and now I'm quoting his words, there was no need to draw any lines. Both Chancellor Merkel and President Macron are long aware of those red lines. On the whole, the conversation was about the lack of alternatives to the Minsk agreement and the crisis situation that has emerged because the agreements were not implemented. The point was that both parties to the conflict should show responsibility. However, in this regard, Putin emphasised the need to use influence on Kiev to make it abandon plans to stage provocations that could lead to serious consequences. Now, note the words, there was no need to draw any lines. Both Chancellor Merkel and President Macron are long aware of the red lines. And just to make it quite clear what that means, we've been getting reports all day of large movements of Russian troops to the Ukrainian border, concentrating in the region of the Lugansk and Donetsk 
People's Republics and, in, and to Crimea. Now, there's been many reports about this over the course of the day, but I'm going to uh, read an extract from a report by South Front, a website which the US State Department claims has connections to the Russian military. So this is what South, Fr South Front uh, reports. Social media is filled with footage of various trains and convoys moving forces towards Krasnodar and especially via the Crimea Bridge to Crimea. Krasnodar is the region of southeastern Russia which adjoins Ukraine. The pieces of equipment include S2 S19 Mstar S self-propelled howitzers, BMP3 um, infantry fighting vehicles, T-72 battle tanks and more. As of March 30th, reports claim that Russia has deployed up to 28 battalion tactical groups. Around 25 more such formations are expected to arrive in the coming days. So there has been a major build-up of Russian forces along the border. The Russians have moved heavy equipment close to the border. And there are also, by the way, additional reports that the Russians have sent more uh, military supplies to the armed forces of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. All of this has created a flurry of concern in Western capitals, and there's also been an increase in the Pentagon's alert st status for the possibility of a pending conflict in Europe. The situation has indeed been of so much concern that we learn from the Russian Defense Ministry website that um, the uh, chief of the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, telephoned uh, uh, the Russian the chief of the Russian General Staff, General Valery Gerasimov, to discuss the situation. I say to discuss the situation, but of course it's not quite clear what they said to each other. Here is what the uh, Russian Defense Ministry's readout of the conversation says. Today, at the initiative of the United States, the Chief of the General Staff of the Armed Forces of the Russian Federation, First Deputy Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation, General of the Army Valery Gerasimov, and the Chairman, Chairman of the Committee of the Chiefs of Staff of the Armed Forces of the United States of America, General Mark Milley, had a telephone conversation. Issues of mutual interest were discussed. Well, it's not difficult to guess what those issues of mutual interest were. Undoubtedly, Milley was trying to discover from his opposite number in Moscow what all of these troop movements to uh, uh, the Ukrainian border mean. Now, what does all this mean? Does this mean that we're now on the brink of a war in eastern Ukraine? I think not. I've always been sceptical that the Ukrainians would really launch an offensive which they are likely to lose. In fact, they are certain to lose if the Russians intervene, which they almost certainly will. And I cannot believe that Western capitals, especially in Berlin and Paris, want that to happen. To be completely frank, I'm not even sure that the administration in Washington wants it to happen. Undoubtedly, there are hardliners there who ache for a conflict in Russia. But from their point of view, a comprehensive military defeat of Ukraine in eastern Ukraine, which might lead to the collapse of the Ukrainian government, in which the United States has invested so much, is hardly something that they would want at this stage in the administration. I'm going to add something further which is that from the European point of view, all the moves over the last few weeks, ever since Josep Borrell, the EU's high representative of foreign affairs, disastrous visit to Moscow a few weeks ago, all the moves from Merkel, Macron and other European leaders is to try to patch things up with Moscow, as I discussed in my previous programme. 
So I don't think that any of the governments of these countries, certainly not the German and the French governments, really want to see a war in eastern Ukraine. These moves that the Russians have been taking over the last few hours are intended to make sure that that war does not happen. There's been some excited talk in parts of the Western media um, that all of this uh, it, it indicates that a Russian military offensive or military attack on Ukraine is pending. I am absolutely sure that is not the case. That is not what the Russians are discussing. It's not what Putin said would happen to Macron or Merkel and Merkel, and it is not what Peskov has just said. What the Russians are saying is that there's been a build-up by Ukraine on the, on the ceasefire line, that Ukraine is in violation of its ceasefire obligations, that there is a, an, an exchange of shelling going on, and that in the light of this, if Ukraine oversteps what Peskov referred to as the red lines, then there will be a devastating Russian military reaction. As for sanctions, which is the only real actual weapon that the West has in its armory in the event of a Russian attack, well, the West has already tried sanctions and, find, and found that they don't work. And of course, in a way that uh, Russia was not, was not the case during the previous uh, Ukrainian war, in 2014, 2015, this time Russia has China firmly at its back. So I think that over the next few hours and days, the telephone lines between Berlin and Paris and probably Washington and Kiev will be buzzing and will be red hot with all sorts of people warning or advising the Ukrainians to calm down, slow down, and to go back to the ceasefire agreement that was negotiated in July last year. Does that mean that a war is definitely ruled out? As I have always said in every programme that I've done on this topic, unfortunately, the answer to that must be no. In a situation like this, where there is a deepening political and economic crisis in Ukraine, where indeed Zelensky's, uh, uh, the, the office of Zelensky's own presidential administration was ransacked by nationalist right-wing Ukrainian protesters just a few days ago. It's very easy to see how someone in, U in Kiev might decide that with the situation becoming as bad as it is, and with contradictory statements coming out of Washington from the Biden administration, the moment has come to go for broke and to launch some kind of attack in eastern Ukraine. Either that would succeed and, Donba and the Donbass would be fully reintegrated into Ukraine, in which case a famous victory would have been achieved, or alternatively there would be a defeat, but only a limited one, which would allow Ukraine to um, agitate in Western capitals for more sanctions and for a more of an end to uh, Nord Stream 2, or conceivably the Russian offensive would be pressed further and there would be a collapse of the Ukrainian government, but it would be a glorious collapse in the minds of the people in Kiev rather than the slow motion collapse they are experiencing now. It would also be one which they would be able to blame on Russia rather than on themselves. It's possible that there are some extremely hardline people in Kiev who think in these um, extreme terms. I have to say that I think on balance the, uh, w the influence of the West, which will be against a further war, will prevail. And I'm far from convinced that everybody in Kiev is aching for such a war either. So I think, still think, more likely than not, a war will be avoided. And I tend to see these moves by the, by the Russians, the troop movements that we have seen over the last few hours, 
the uh, strong words from Peskov, following on upon the strong words from Putin, I think they, they're all intended to achieve that result. I am sure that Merkel and Macron will have come away rather shaken. And of course, the fact that General Miller is now telephoning General Gerasimov, obviously concerned about the situation, so it shows that the point has struck home with Washington also. Well, we will see. I don't know how uh, much longer this situation can persist for. The Ukrainian forces have been on the ceasefire line now for some time. I think it's unlikely that they will launch a strike, but probably the next few weeks will tell us one way or another. If there is an escalation in, in rhetoric from Kiev and threats of action, then of course it may be that in spite of all my doubts and all my scepticism, a war is indeed coming. Otherwise, I would expect that from about the, the uh, second or third week of April, we will start to see the situation, the crisis, if you like, in eastern Ukraine begin to abate. One way or another, we, we should know over the course of the next two weeks or month at the most. Thank you very much for joining me for this programme. Um, please remember to check out our other channels where um, uh, the, our main channel, the Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo. Please also check out Alex's channel. Please also check out our new channel where we show you the interactions between some of our viewers and ourselves on our live streams. Also check out our other platforms, BitChute, Library and Rumble, and also Odyssey, which we have found to be, by the way, an excellent, indeed outstanding platform. Please also remember, if you can, to support us through PayPal, Patreon and Subscribestar. I would just say that we accept uh, um, donations in all uh, the new various forms of currency that exist. Um, of course, also Bitcoin, if anybody has any, uh, any of those uh, lying around that they want to dispose of. That would certainly make a dramatic difference to our resources. And of course, also, don't forget to look up our shop. Look at the amazing things we have there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our uh, famous t-shirts, long-sleeved and short-sleeved, and all the rest. And thank you for joining me for this program. And I look forward to you joining me in further programs, both on this channel and on all our others. And have a wonderful day. Thank you.